Hello YouTube, and welcome to another episode of The Educated Barbarian. I apologize for the delay, usually these videos always come out on Tuesdays, but for those of you that have been following, I am actually battling a Japanese company to actually get some videos back, and they are making it extremely difficult, it's extremely time consuming, so I had to delay my entire schedule. And right now we're going to start a special arc, it's in a sense a little break from the videos about women because these videos are very long, they take me a ton of time to write and they're very heavy in terms of concepts so I don't want to put them out too quickly. I want you guys to be able to digest the information. And even for me, I have found that some topics like these, like women for example, tend to be very consuming and my thoughts become very occupied and I become obsessed and that's not good because you cannot produce good concepts. When you are hyper-focused, you need the ability to actually zoom back and actually scope out a bit. So the break in this case is going to be pills. What I mean by this is that there is a very specific chapter in Beyond Good and Evil where Nietzsche pretty much gives you one-liners. He gives you punchlines where he explains nothing. He just gives you a concept or idea and he runs with it. And it's up to you to decide what it means. And I have found that even though this chapter has no real continuity to it, I can't really make a video based on it entirely. What I can do is I can isolate the themes. So one of the themes that I had from this chapter was women, like feminism, emancipation, the feminine essence, etc., etc. And another one that I remarked and that I realized I could make something good of is the pills. Because in this chapter, Nietzsche shares red pills, black pills, and white pills. He doesn't call them that, I've decided to categorize them as such, but it's the way it's going to work. So for today's video, we are going to be breaking the conditioning. I'm going to share with you my favorite red pills from Nietzsche, I'm going to explain them all. We're going to start with principles, then it's going to lead us directly into judgment, then into morality, and then into nihilism. And you will see that even though Nietzsche never wrote these pills in that uh, order, I think that for the most part, it's what makes the most sense. So you can expect that for today. And then next week or in two weeks rather, but next week technically it's going to be on the black pill and then white pills. Most of these pills tend to be philosophical concepts. And it's a nice contrast with what we have on the internet nowadays, because if you have clicked on the video, maybe you expected red pills in the internet meme format, meaning one-liners that are going to reveal some great truth about the universe, but which for the most part tend to be bogus or they tend to just be contrarian nonsense and they don't add much to your life. Actually, I found that most people who get sucked into the world of red pills end up the worst for it. It doesn't really give them an ability to break the conditioning or to see the truth. If anything, it just makes them depressed. And on top of that, it makes them smug because they think they have unveiled some secrets about the universe when in reality, they just have learned like 0.001% of what there, there is to learn. So I don't want you to think that today I'm going to reveal some anything like some groundbreaking truths, but it's still going to be very interesting and you will find that most of the knowledge and most of the worth we will get from these pills are coming from our ability to interpret them. So before we get into that, I want to share with you a quote of my own making, one that is going to make sense only at the end of these three episodes. I'm not going to explain it, I'm just going to put it in your lap and let you do with it what you will. All red pills are black pills. All black pills are blue pills. All white pills are red pills. That is going to be for that. Now, we're going to enter the very interesting world of Nietzschean red pills that exist far beyond the oftentimes very silly and edgy world of internet pills. Because even though the name red pill is not going to give you much faith in what there is to be presented, I think that there still lays the ability to give you the power to shatter the reality around you, a reality that for the most part is an illusion, and that is actually the power of philosophy. Philosophy is a mean to interpret the world, and if you do it properly, you should be able to create an interpretation that is as close to nature as possible, aka as close to the truth as possible. And if you manage to do that, you're also going to be able to realize and recognize when what is around you is actually an illusion. Most people live an illusion. They live shrouded in illusion, and that is why the concept of the red pill is so interesting. 
But you will notice that for the most part, the red pill is effortless. Like for example, in the movie that gave it its name, you just take the red pill and it shatters the illusion. It's not as easy because for the most part, the illusion is one you selected for yourself. All of the, uh, the misguided truths that you have filled your brain with, you did that because you allowed them to actually take that spot. And sure, the environment and the people around you had an influence on that, but you were still the one who kept them in their place. So the only person that can actually reject them and actually be able to, for once, see this plane of existence for what it is, is you. And the way to do that is going to be, again, these quotes. Now, I'm going to give you interpretations, not just the quote, because I personally hate this new culture of trying to promote philosophy by just posting one quotation from an author. If you go on Instagram, sadly for me, the algorithm has figured out that I like literature and philosophy, so I get bombarded with one-liners, and for the most part, it's stupid. Of course, sometimes it's interesting, but the issue with these is that they reduce philosophy to its simplest expression. It's good to make philosophy accessible, but if we dumb it down and we vulgarize it to the extent that it just becomes an Instagram trend, it's not going to be good. You see that with self-improvement as well. Self-improvement, which by the way is a branch of philosophy, has been reduced to just one-liners, quotations, like, never give up, great, thank you so much for your wisdom, can you now explain to me why? Can you explain the philosophical concept underneath? All of that is much more interesting. I believe in your ability to read the chapter by yourself, a chapter four, but I also know that you like to hear what I believe. So let me share with you my favorite excerpts from chapter four, which is called Apothegms and Interludes. Now, in this first quotation, you will see that the theme of principle is immediately present because that is our first layer. It's the first stage of the structure I am here to present. With his principles, a man seeks either to dominate, justify, honor, reproach, or conceal his habits. Two men with the same principles seek fundamentally different ends therewith. So here we see that Nietzsche presents principles as something that is subjective, that should be obvious, something that depends on your perspective, but also something that from individual to individual cannot be the same. And that is already a big problem because it shatters, it shatters the social pact. The social pact details that we're supposed to have common values to be able to build a society around. But we also understand that because each individual is special and itself is different from one another, you're not going to have the same principle applied the same way for every single person. And since principles are not issued by the causa sui, they're not just coming down from the sky, they're actually the expression of our sensibilities, we also know that there needs to be at some point the realization that principles are going to clash from individual to individual. And that for the most part, we can expect the individuals to come up with systems and principles that benefit them. Just like a society, which is, by the way, a group of individuals, comes up with a, a, a set of rules, of principles, that is going to benefit society. No society is trying to impose a system of conduct that is going to lead to its destruction. It makes no sense. You can even start to believe that societies are cognizant creatures and entities because a society will first and foremost always try to perpetuate its, its existence, at least when it's healthy. A society that has degenerated and is decadent is actually seeking the opposite. It's seeking to destroy itself. It's something we're going to discuss when we start talking nihilism. But in this case, important because I believe that with red pills, there is a very simple rule to follow. A pill that is unexplained is only half effective and those who swallow without knowledge only poison themselves. The same goes for principles. I think that principles are something that are very intimate. It's an intimate belief. And if you have principles that you don't question or that you don't know the origin of, chances are someone else placed them there. Could be society, could be someone else. It doesn't make them bad, but it makes them unquestioned and that makes them dangerous because principles lead you. You don't really lead principles. That is the same idea as with the will. You create the will. You are the will, but you also will yourself. So you have to make absolutely sure that you're going to will yourself towards your betterment. It's the same for principles. Constantly question your principles but never question them in the sense that you could potentially give, the, give up on them if they become too much. In, a, in, in that sense, it's a balance to strike. Your principles are supposed to work for your benefit, 
but you will have situations sometimes in your life you're going to face where it would be more comfortable to give up on the principle, but it won't necessarily benefit you in the long term. It might just be that the principle is going to, pro uh, to prevent you from obtaining riches in the moment or obtaining some pleasure, but that actually is the point of the principle. It protects you from these types of poison. Now, all of that is always in accordance to will to power. Because, of course, I'm discussing Nietzsche, so I'm going to apply his mode of thought. And at the center of everything in life is world to power. So principles are no different. Principles are created by individuals, okay? They're not just, they're not just things that pop out of thin air. And they always are going to benefit the individual because the individual always wants to accumulate more power and to express that power. So, in that sense, these principles are a good thing in absolute terms. But at the same time, they can become extremely dangerous if they become corrupted. And when it comes to these principles and the ability of the principle to apply to several people at once, while principled intentions might recur, so they might have synchronicity between individuals, their desired consequences always differ. And that's important to keep in mind if we're going to look at principles again as a positive force that can help build healthy societies. Even if you manage to find a principle that is good for one person and that makes sense, if you apply it across the board because each individual differs, you might get all individuals on the same board. They'll be on the same boat and they'll all have the same intention. But the consequences on the way the principles are applied in reality are not going to be the same. And that is, of course, also a red pill that makes it difficult to buy democracy and to buy our, our current societies because we want to believe that everyone is going to follow the same rules, get the same results. We want equality of outcomes and also equality of principles, therefore. But that simply doesn't work. You cannot expect everyone to have the same principles. And actually, uh, a corrupting of the democratic ideal is a form of fascism where because you want everyone to have the same principles, because you expect the outcome of it to be equality and happiness for all, you end up forcing each individual into these principles, and that leads to the destruction of the individuality. So, this is why I said that principles need to be observed, and they need to be regarded for what they are, tools that are created by our own subjectivity. For the second quote, we're going to stay in the realm of principles. Nietzsche tells us what? A great man? I only see merely the play actor of his own ideal. Same logic here. It is very common to look at people and to try from their intention to derive anything about their character. And in this society where everyone wears a mask, it's simply not possible because we are all going to do things that benefit us and we have to project an illusion in the eyes of others. That's why the red pill is a very crucial concept in a sense. It's not just because it's going to allow you to see through the illusion and to see through the behavior of others and of society in general, but also because it's going to reveal a lot of things about your own behavior. Because one that wears the mask for too long can become the mask. And when you are at that point, you, come, you become disillusioned about your own self. You stop knowing who you are. And that is when you become dangerous for yourself because you have relinquished your identity. It's also a warning against uh, judgments of values that are based entirely on intentions. You cannot just look at someone and say, okay, they did a great deed and therefore it makes them a good person. You don't know what their true intentions were. You're projecting or you are looking only at the intentions that they want you to believe they have. And on top of that, the most important part of all of that is the consequence. What did their actions create? Not just at face value, but on the, in, in the long term. What were the repercussions on the societal level of their actions? If you are able to read into that, you are going to see through the actor. You are going to see through the ideal. An ideal that, just like with principles, benefits the guy. Most of the time when someone is being good, they are only being good for themselves. The idea that selfless actions exist is something that Nietzsche disagrees with 100%. Disinterested deeds don't exist. They are only disinterested in the eyes of others, which in a sense makes it an interested deed. Because by doing something disinterested, you, you, in the eyes of others, appear to be a good person. And that by itself is a benefit. So it wasn't disinterested in the first place. 
And therefore, all of these Ds are only really acts of power. World to power, of course, being at the center of everything. Every single human is trying to further his position in life and will do absolutely everything in his power to be able to do that. There is nothing wrong with that. It's not pathological, or at least sometimes it can become that. But the average man doesn't get to that extreme. We just do things that are going to make us into better humans, which also means that is going to make us more powerful, that is aligned. Any type of morality that is opposed to that and thinks the opposite, things that things that you do that make you less powerful and weaker is moral, is nihilism, it is slave morality. We're going to touch on that later. I say that because be it principles or good deeds are not demonized by Nietzsche. He simply wants you to actually lift the veil and see it for what it actually is. Since humans constantly try to shape the world around them after their image. And actually this is, as I said again, not a pathology, it's actually a sign of health. Constantly trying to grow yourself, your soul, your body, your influence, your power, your wealth, to a certain degree, and also wanting that to have an impact on the world is good. And you can pinpoint a toxic ideology by the fact that they, dis they discourage their members to do that and they try to point the finger at people who do that. I believe that there is a point where it becomes too much and you become glutinous, but the average human is nowhere near that. The average human is too small. We make, we make ourselves too small and it's not good. We need to be bigger. We need to inflate as much as possible. That is world to power. That is the fight against nihilism. Nihilism is the opposite. Nihilism is trying to shape yourself after the wood, which you could also call conformism. The problem with that is that it stops being the expression of the human soul. Now it's just the expression of a slave. That, exact, that is exactly what a slave is. A slave is incapable of creating his own sense and meaning. He just copies the sense and meaning of the wood around him. Now, for this idea, I'm going to connect directly to the next quote that is going to concern itself with sympathy. And the concept of sympathy is key. It's something we're going to touch uh, upon again because Nietzsche insists on it. Sympathy is a principle in a sense. It's an expression of the self. And for the most part, our society sees it as a good thing. So our society ranks sympathy as an act of power, right? It empowers people. It's nice to, to actually extend sympathy to others. The thing is that this sympathy that we see nowadays also is exactly what Nietzsche just described. It's not that a good person has sympathy. It's that having sympathy is a way for someone to appear as a good per person. And sympathy by itself has its limitations because it quickly creates a situation where you are at a catch-22. Let me read you the quote in question. Sympathy for all would be harshness and cruelty for thee, my good neighbor. The logic in this is quite simple. It's crystal clear to understand. If I have sympathy for you, by definition, it means that I have antipathy for someone else because I have seen in you traits or behavior or character developments that I appreciate and therefore I praise you for it. I extend my sympathy to you. I'm warm towards you. But it also, this also means that someone who is going to showcase opposite traits, I'm going to be this sympathetic towards. And therefore, there is discrimination in sympathy. And it's absolutely necessary. Sympathy could also be seen as a synonym for love or affection. The people that you love in your life, you love as an act of discrimination. Why do you love them? Why don't you love everyone? Why don't you love the stranger you just met? Well, for a simple reason. It's because it's not aligned with how we function as humans. We are social creatures, absolutely, but we are also bonding creatures. Your social ability is going to be projected onto the world and it's going to stick to some people that are going to be special to you. These people create a family, they create a friendship circle, they create a community. They're close to one another, not because they possess the ability to have sympathy or humans have it for the most part, but because they have chosen to link their sympathies with one another. I say it because this is absolutely essential for societies to exist. It's not something that Nietzsche is saying is a bad thing. It becomes a bad thing when it becomes the rule. When you end up in a system, like I described previously, where, for example, in democracies, we're supposed to all be equal, and therefore we're also supposed to extend sympathy to everyone. Christian faith has the same morality. 
And actually, most of the democratic values that you see in European countries, for example, just stole that straight up from Christianity, where you are supposed to love your neighbor. Now, I want you to stop for a second and think, what is the neighbor? Is the neighbor just someone who lives near you? In my interpretation, the neighbor is someone that you know. And then it makes a ton of sense to love your neighbor. But if neighbor is a synonym for human, now it's stupid because it's not possible. You cannot love everyone equally. Because if you love everyone equally, you don't really love anyone. Love is an act of discrimination and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. So my love for someone cannot be the love for someone else. Because if that would be the case, as he says here, sympathy for all would be harshness and cruelty for thee. And you see that especially with the type of people who preach the type of message, who say you have to love everyone. Look at the way they behave against people they don't approve. They hate them. They are cruel towards them. Why? Because their sympathy for all is a farce. It's a lie. It's something they say to appear as good people. It makes them look moral. But in practice, beyond intention is consequences. The consequence is that it makes them cruel. And more than that, I would say that the most despicable people I've ever seen in my life, the most cruel people, were the ones who had that hippie mindset. They love so much that their hatred is pure, it's crystal pure. And when it's directed towards you, you feel it. And the question is, is that worth it? Is that worth it to have someone who loves apparently intensely some and hates intensely others? It could even put into question their love. Do these people actually love in the first place or is it also part of the act? A selective type of love is much more aligned with what humans are because an ideal, like sympathy for all, turned rule loses meaning as any subjectivity gets severed. And this is why I included this in the principles. A principle is subjective. If you try to make a principle into an objective standard and you try to push it onto people, now it becomes dangerous. It's the exact same with sympathy. Sympathy can be a, bl a comforting blanket and it can also be a sharp weapon. Once you make sympathy without, without subjectivity, you have a dangerous weapon because if you globalize sympathy, it is a form of, tyr of tyranny. You force people to feel a certain way about other people. You cannot force feelings. You cannot force affi affiliations. But I have noticed that in this world, it becomes more and more prevalent when you are told you need to care about this group of people. But I don't care. So what do I do? I manufacture sympathy. And very likely, the very same people who force me to care also manufacture sympathy for others or have outright hatred for others. Which means that we live in a fake world, a world that is a complete illusion. Red peeling yourself about sympathy is going to allow you to have pure sympathy, to have a sympathy that actually is worth something, one that you are only going to that you are going to only give to a very select amount of people. Because globalized sympathy is a false anthem. It simply doesn't work. It's Caribbean world where we're all supposed to be nice and love each other, but we all know that societies like this simply does not, do not exist. A society is based on the idea that people inside the society have benefits and have, are privileged, and people outside of the society are the enemies. This is how it functions. It functions like this at the individual level. It functions like this at societal level. It's how humans have always functioned. And any type of functionment that goes against that would either necessitate a complete shift of principles on the individual level that cannot be pushed, or it's just going to lead of, to a society of illusion where people lie to themselves. Now, we're going to move on to judgment because, as you have noticed, principle can also lead to judgment. If I have a principle and you don't share it, I'm going to judge, judge you because you lack something that I believe to be important. If you impose principles on people, you pass judgment upon them because you judge them unworthy until they actually apply and adopt your very principle. And this is when we get into the relationship that the individual has with himself but also with the group. One does not hate as long as one disesteems, but only when one esteems equal or superior. Now, in relation to judging, it's because hatred, of course, just like sympathy, is a judgment. You pass judgment onto someone. That is by itself a subjective action. It cannot be objective. It isn't possible. But in the case of hate, it's very interesting because in the same line, you will notice that this society of sympathy 
is also a society of hate. The word hate is thrown around all the time nowadays. Hate this, hate that. This person hate these groups. If you say this, then you hate people. Actually, you also hear people say, hey, if you don't have sympathy for this group that I arbitrarily decided, then it means you hate them. You are not allowed to just be indifferent. We are not allowed to just stand neutral nowadays. You have to be either for or against. You are just not able to be in the middle. And this is why nuances are dying and why the political discourse is so idiotic nowadays is because it's all or nothing and that's simply not the way to organize a society. As far as hate, as far as hate goes, Nietzsche has a very interesting uh, reading of hate. Nowadays, you often hear hate as in, you think that this person is inferior to you and therefore you hate them. But Nietzsche says that this is not possible because hatred is only something that you can extend to an equal or a superior, since a superior cannot hate an inferior because hatred implies involvement. And in this case, if we're going to use an allegory from the animal kingdom, the lion wastes no thoughts on the roach. Le lion ne se concerne pas euh, de le lion ne se concerne pas avec les opinions du kafa. It's important to grasp because you will have noticed that this hate campaign and the notion and idea that every time you disagree with someone or refuse to extend sympathy with someone you hate them mostly comes from the weak. It comes from the inferior and usually the people they target with that accusation is the superior. And what they're doing is very simple. It's a type of psychological projection because the superior is simply not capable of feeling hate towards an inferior. For example, you are in your kitchen and you spot a roach. Do you feel hatred towards the roach? No, it is absolutely impossible because hatred would actually imply the idea that there is a level of equality and a certain connection. The only thing you feel towards the roach is disgust because you dominate the roach. Likewise, if your boss is giving you a tough time, maybe he hates you on a personal level, but in the social hierarchy of the workplace, that's not hate, it's just domination. You interpret that as hate because if the feelings were inversed, that's how you would feel about the boss. And maybe you feel like this about the boss. It's what I said about these people who extend sympathy all the time, that they are the most hateful. For the most part, people who say, who call hate every time they see someone they disagree with, are the people who actually are full of hatred in their heart. Hate is widely overblown nowadays, and I would say overrated. It's an almost, it's an almost uh, foreign feeling and sentiment for some, meaning that you need to be a specific type of person to feel hatred. For the most part, what people feel is, as I said, disgust. And from disgust actually comes the desire to crush. If you think that someone is so repulsive, like a roach, for example, that you go out and kill them, that's abhorrent, of course. You committed a crime against a fellow human, but it's not hate. It's not a hate crime. These words are antithetical. It makes no sense. Most crimes are not based on hate because if you have the ability to kill someone, then it's because you dominate them at some point or the other. We can call them something else, domination crimes which would make them worse, in my opinion, because it means that you, the strong, abuse your power to actually impose your will onto the weak. And therefore, you, you experience your desire to crush the weak, to crush the roche. Any other reading of that type of sentiment tends to be tainted by emotion. Nowadays, hate is something that people call out because we believe it to be the worst thing. You hate someone, you despise someone, and that's terrible. I say that the opposite would be true. What would be truly terrifying and dangerous would be someone who kills without hate. Someone who is just a cold-blooded killer. Someone who decides that based on logical principles and their own principles, exterminating another human is justified without any feelings or emotions. If we were to get someone like this, and actually dictators existed in the past like this, they would be the most dangerous. Actually, I'm not going to cite names. I don't, I don't want to incite anyone to say anything, but... If you compare genocides across the board, you will notice that the ones that shock the most and that we still talk about to this day are the ones based on hate. Or there is a legitimate hatred of a certain group of people and they were exterminated just for that hatred alone. But these tend to be the most meek in terms of numbers, meaning that they are the most potent in terms of emotions. It shocks us. But in terms of raw numbers and raw numbers of deaths especially, these don't do much. 
Look at the top genocides in the world. It's always the same. It's what I would call a bureaucratic genocide. It's a dictator, a figure, uh, the head of the state that decided that based on statistics, a group of people just needed to die. Or because they were opposed to him politically, they just needed to die. There was no hatred involved. It was just a cold calculus. These make the most victims because it's most easier to dispose of human beings if you have no feelings towards them. Hate is still a feeling. And the people who hate hate, paradoxically, should keep that in mind. You do not want someone who is going to go after you with no hate because that is much more dangerous. Now, it's important to go beyond that reading of emotions because, again, we're trying to red pill ourselves. So, keep in mind that hate often expresses an inability to manifest negative portion and is therefore reserved for the weak. Hate, I would describe as synonymous with impotent rage because unexpressed hate that doesn't manifest as physical violence is nothing, right? It's something that the weak does. The strong is not going to start with a peremptive threat like hate. They'll just crush you. They'll, there is no need for hate. If I need to hate you, it's because most of the time I can't do anything for you. It's why also the rhetoric of thinking that hate speech can lead to like heinous acts or crimes is for the most part false because there is no transferability between the two. The type of people who are going to hate are not going to also afterwards commit the crime because because they hate, they express and prove their inability to go the extra mile. That doesn't apply all the time. Of course, you can find me examples in history where actually hatred motivated the massacre. But these tend to be exceptions. On an individual level, it's not the case. Now, it might sound strange because the group is made of individuals. At the end of the episode, I'm going to share a quote with you that is going to explain why I appear to be engaging in a lapse of logic. Here, I mostly want to focus on hate and what it means. Because you will find that the people who utilize hate as an accusation, for the most part, do it to keep the strong in check. The strong is incapable of hating, but he's capable of crushing you. If you are the weak, what is your weapon to defend yourself from being crushed? Well, what you're going to do is you're going to use a moral weapon. You're going to accuse the strong of hating you. And now you have made them look to be bad. You made them look like a bad person, just like what we discussed previously. So it's terrible optics for them. That has a strong chance of preventing them from ever reaching the point where they're going to crush you. In a sense, hatred is the shield of the weak. It's both their weapon, it's their spear, and it's also their shield. It is what they master with the most ability. And in this case, it is a form of morality. It's a form of morality that is used by the weak. The weak that, again, is the type that also utilizes uh, hatred as a weapon because they cannot manifest their portions in any other way. And you have to keep in mind that World to power will always find a way to express itself, be it via actions or via words. Hatred is a form of will to power. And this ability to turn morality into a weapon was discussed previously when we talked about the uh, slave insurrection. That's exactly what they did. How did the slaves go from being incapable to, of influencing morality to becoming the masters of morality? Well, the answer is simple. They used morality against the masters. They turned it on its head. If the master is the strong and you the slave are the weak, the master can crush you at any point. So what do you do? You transform morality to make it so that the master that is the strong now appears to be the evil one and you appear to be the good one. You turn your weakness into a strength and you turn the hatred, your hatred, into the hatred of the strong, a hatred that he never felt in the first place. And now I think that it explains to you why our society is based on hatred. It's a society that pretends to be based on sympathy, but once you look beyond the surface, it's all about hate. Hate is the dominant feeling in most people's heart. It's that hatred that motivates their sympathy and not the other way around. And this was for the judgment part. So um, before we actually move to the morality part, which is connected with what I just described, we have to make a pit stop at utilitarianism because it's a concept that is often misunderstood. I put it in between judgment and morality because you will find that many people who read Nietzsche come out believing that he despised uh, utility 
and he didn't think that utilitarian uh, philosophy was worth anything. That's not true. What he didn't like is the judgment that utilitarians pass onto others and onto themselves as well. Let me read you the quote. You utilitarians, you too love the euro only as a vehicle for your inclinations. Again, we see the notion that the actions of people don't necessarily reflect their intentions. What matters is their consequences. In this case, what you see a ton with people who claim to be utilitarian is the fact that what they are going to preach and their philosophy is going to lead to the good, and therefore their methods are the good by connection, and any other method is the bad, which also means that anything utilitarian is by definition good. I think that is the reason why Nietzsche always speaks up against them, is because he believes that to be untrue, just like he believes any form of morality that claims to be for the greater good to be idiotic. It's not for the greater good, it's for your good, it's for the good of the group, and that good needs to be questioned because at no point can we say for certain that it is going to remain true across the ages. Utilitarianism, in the same vein, has become a form of morality. It's a form of moral usefulness, in a sense. And the problem when you start to claim that you are useful is that you start denying others the ability to question your utility in the first place which is also dangerous because if I tell you, okay, my, my religion, let's say religion, my religion is the utilitarian one. It means that it's the one that applies to the life of humans and that actually makes it better. By doing that, I'm actually claiming that my religion is the good one because all religions are utilitarian. For those of you that have followed the entire discussion around functional training, it's the same. All training is functional because it's the, it's the, the, le propre, j'allais dire en français, c'est le propre de l'entraînement. It's the specs of any training to be functional at something. It's the same for any mode of thought or any philosophy. There is no such thing as a bad philosophy. There is only a bad philosophy for a certain goal. All philosophy can be good if applied to a certain goal. It's what Nietzsche is trying to preach here. And I say that because I see too many times people saying that you cannot utilize Nietzschean philosophy to improve yourself because it would try to make it utilitarian. Well, you misunderstand why Nietzsche didn't like utilitarianism. He doesn't say that you cannot use philosophy for your own sake or to make something of it. That's how you're painting him, trying to paint Nietzsche as a guy who was just writing for the sake of writing. No, he had a clear goal in mind, but he always was very open about his goal, whereas utilitarians tend to not be. What Nietzsche rejects is not the practice of asking for what, but the tendency to always answer for good, because if you always answer for good, you deny, you deny others the ability to question what good is in the first place, and you willfully ignore that good is subjective. So, if your philosophy is utilitarian, its only utility is towards a certain goal, and certainly not all goals. Apply the same logic to religion, apply the same logic to morality, and you will come closer to this Nietzschean red pill. Utilitarian philosophers paint themselves as robots, akin to Stoics, by the way, it's the reason why Nietzsche disliked both, and by doing that, they clumsily hide their human hearts. And the issue with that is, if you claim to be useful, and only useful for the greater good, since the greater good does not exist because it's an objective notion applied to subjective individuals, you end up losing sight of your principles and the reason why they were useful in the first place. Same with morality. Nietzsche was never opposed to morality. What he wanted is the ability to actually go back to its source, not claim it was just causa sui and coming from nowhere, and he wanted the ability to question that based on the origin that he then deciphered. It's absolutely important to do that. Do that with every single value and principle in your life, and you will become a more adjusted human being. And this leads us to morality again, because morality must be questioned. Knowledge for its own sake, that is a snare laid by morality. We are thereby completely entangled in morals once more. Knowledge is only worth its applicability, just like morals only make sense in the context of their usefulness. Again, yes, I followed that quote with the other quote because it shows that Nietzschean philosophy has its usefulness. Nietzsche himself, itself, itself, Nietzsche is a thing now. Nietzsche himself said it here. 
if you just say, well, he's philosophizing for the sake of just creating philosophy, okay, but now you just destroyed the very meaning of philosophy because philosophy is the interpretation of the word. So if it's just writing for the sake of writing or thinking for the sake of thinking, that truly has no meaning, it has no goal. And it's the same with morality. How many people blindly follow morality and if you ask them what for, they tell you, well, for the sake of morality or for the sake of being a good person. But that's the same thing. You're repeating the same thing. So you're following morals for the sake of morals. It's knowledge for its own sake. And that is, as Nietzsche describes here, a trap. Because I describe societies as, as living cognizant beings that seek to perpetuate their existence. Morality is a bit of the same. Morals are parasites that exist only because we allow them to. It's because we enter them into our lives. It's the same with principles. It can become a problem if we start to look at the parasite as something that must be there. Because it might very well be that the parasite is actually inoculating in us a very dangerous disease. So the ability to flick away the parasite is important. But because before you can do that, you have to identify it. And before that, you have to be able to detect it. And even before that, you have the ability to believe that it doesn't belong there in the first place. You were not born a moral being. Humans become moral because of society and culture. You are a primal being to start with. And yes, morality was created by humans. I don't deny that. But believing that because we created morals, it means that we are incapable of disconnecting us from them is stupid. It's the opposite. We created them so we can break them down as well. So usefulness is absolutely an important part of philosophy. So if a philosophy is not useful for you, then it is simply not adapted and you need to just let go of it. Trying to remove philosophy or trying to remove knowledge or morality from that frame, the frame of usefulness, makes judgments of value impossible. Because how are you supposed to judge the ability of, a, of like a set of morals, for example, to improve the life of humans if you don't have the ability to question it altogether? It's not possible. And this is when we get into the questioning of the, the morality of the self and of society with the following quote. To be ashamed of one's immorality is a step on the ladder at the end of which one is ashamed also of one's morality. Why would you be ashamed of both? It's because in both cases, you are following judgments of values, you are following principles that are not your own. And for the most part, you get a taste of that when society shames you because you did not follow morals. The issue is that most people stop there. And in a sense, it reinforces the conditioning because they think, okay, I did something bad, I was immoral, so I'm going to stick to morality even strongly and I'm never going to question it. Because it must be good. I was mistreated for not following it. Well, it should have opened your eyes in the first place. The level of shame you felt at, at not following morality should allow you to also question whether or not you should fall shame for, uh, for actually following morality. Keep in mind that morality is a system that shifts constantly and you might not be the one to decide on said morality. It's why it cracks me up so much when, again, this generation of very symp sympathetic fools are going to judge our ancestors for 400 years ago saying, oh, they were monsters because they enslaved people. Take these same idiots, plug them in a time machine and send them back 400 years, they would enslave more than anyone else. They would be 100% pro-slavery, they would be the most racist people. Why? They only exist with the morality of their time. They have absolutely no ability to question it. And if I told one of these people that, they would tell me, no, absolutely not. My moral values would tell me that slavery is bad. Yeah, but your moral values are not intrinsic to your personality. They were installed in you because you were born in this age. We all, all humans, and that's, that's the red pill for red pills in reality, we all have the moral values of our epic. You believe in the things that your age, the age that you exist in, teaches you. And if you were not born at this age, and if you were not born at this time, you would not believe the same thing. You would most likely be a completely different person. Tough to swallow, but once you can swallow that, you can start questioning the teachings that you receive nowadays because morality is a human construct. It has to be questioned by the individuals to which it applies because if it doesn't, it becomes a coercion system. Nowadays, morality is, in a sense, a form of fascism because you are forced to follow something, a system that you don't understand. And if you have taken a, a good look at Western society, for example, 
you will have noticed that governments and supra supreme entities that decide our everyday lives have started to use morality against us. They have started to manipulate you into believing that if you want to be a good person, you have to follow morality. A morality that just so happens to be perfectly aligned with their own benefits. This is when everything actually connects. Every single human only does things when it benefits them. If someone pushes a type of morality on you or a set of principles, chances are it's not for your benefit, it's for their benefit. But you might be at the bottom of the pyramid and you just, again, receive trickle-down morality and you have no idea what is going on, you have no power to resist because the elites are dominating you. The best way to repel yourself to that is to actually take a look at the way the elite lives. All of these people that get to decide the principles of society, do they follow these principles themselves? 99% of the time, they don't. And therefore, it means one thing. They understand that these, these principles do not benefit the average person, but it benefits them if they get other people to actually follow it. It's why I said that all of that is a system of coercion. It's up to the individual to actually question that and to elevate himself above that type of morality, which leads to the Ubermensch. The Ubermensch, outside of all of the descriptions that we can make of him, is the one that defines his own values. Now, I differ with Nietzsche in the sense that Nietzsche believes that the Ubermensch is, is special and that the average person will never achieve that. The average person is too stupid, too incompetent, and the average person will always be subjected to the blue pill. They will always live in a world of illusion because they're not strong enough to break the illusion. And even if they did break the illusion, they wouldn't survive it. You know, it's like if you took the red pill and your psyche and your mind couldn't cope with reality, your mind would break, you would, you would shatter and leave the weight of the realization that everything you ever believed was a lie. That's what Nietzsche believes. He believes that the Ubermensch can occur, but in very rare individuals. And the problem is that I cannot live like this because uh, in, in contrast with Nietzsche, I'm much more of an idealist and I'm very romantic in the way I think. I believe that everyone has the power to actually shatter the conditioning and break the conditioning. It's why I make uh, uh, philosophical videos. It's because I think that everyone has the ability to grasp what I explained to you. Now, are you going to do it or not? It's entirely up to your own decision. It's up to what you believe is going to be beneficial for you. But I warn you that if you don't do that, and if you allow morality to pile up on top of you, you are going to suffer the consequences with the following quote. Under peaceful conditions, the militant man attacks himself. What happens when that system of morality leads to people who are being bombarded with principles that don't align with themselves, principles that eventually end up contradicting themselves within the individual? Well, what happens is that, as Nietzsche describes, the militant man attacks himself. And what it means in this scenario is that since morals are built in values, giving humans a reason to live, because for the most part, that's what they are. They're not, they don't only teach you how to live. They can also become a reason to live. Some people live to be nice. So they have embraced sympathy, which is a type of morality, as their sole reason for existence. If you do that, what exactly happens when the existence of the morality stops finding a justification in the outside world. What happens when that built-in value starts to enter a, a form of contradiction with the world around you? Or what if it becomes useless? What if you start living in a situation where you realize that the morality is making you more miserable, but you are incapable of actually breaking free from the morality? Well, what starts happening is that you are going to start to cannibalize yourself. If we're going to look at a man who has a set of values, for example, let's say protect the weak, that set of value is only useful if there are weaklings to protect. What if this man runs out of weaklings? Nowadays, he has no reason to exist anymore. Two things could happen. He's going to create weaklings, so he will do whatever he can to actually find a reason to exist, or he will turn against himself because he is the strong and he protects the weak, and therefore, logically, to protect the weak, as a perpetuity, like for perpetuity, you are going to get rid of yourself. It's like a, it's a metaphor that I like to use for political movements. Most political movements and most ideologies are packs of wild dogs. 
If you've ever seen a pack of wild dogs, I have seen that in my village in the mountains, what they do is they hunt together. Small dogs, big dogs, they hunt together. And they will be entirely fine as long as there is prey. But the second there is no more prey, they will start to turn against its weakest members until there is only one member left. And that is because they had a morality. Their morality was hunt. That was their set of principles, hunt. Once that set of principles wasn't applicable because there was no more prey, it didn't just disappear. It didn't shatter in thin air. It turned against itself. So they still hunted themselves. And the last dog has no one else to hunt. He's a dog, so he's not going to eat himself. But humans are more complicated than that. And therefore, a human would actually cannibalize himself in that situation. He will find in himself a reason to exist. And by doing that, he will destroy himself. Because it's always better to find a reason for your existence in your own destruction than to just have no reason to exist in the first place. This is nihilism, by the way. It's a very roundabout way to say it, but it's what inhibits the heart of most people nowadays. Their entire life is directed towards their own destruction. They don't realize it, they almost likely never realize it, but that is the truth. And that is because we have entered peaceful conditions. And because we're all militants, because we all have a set of moral that was injected in us from birth, we all have that something in our chest that says that we have to do this, and if we cannot express it because it's not actually useful anymore, it lost its usefulness, we're going to find a usefulness for it. That's the beauty of morality as well. Empty morality will find its use. It will always be recycled into something else. And that leads to situations when, because we're not allowed to question morality, we are not able to get rid of them. In a sense, I want you to think of morality like cells. Cells multiply in your body and that's good and all. But a cell that becomes dormant or becomes inactive or becomes corrupted turns into a cancerous cell. Thankfully, you have a immune system that gets rid of the cell. But if your immune system is not competent enough or isn't working, the cell is going to multiply itself and you're going to develop a tumor and you're going to get cancer. Morality is the exact same. We have piled morality on top of people, but we never actually put in a design to allow the individual to get rid of the ones that start to become cancerous. So sympathy for all, for example, is a great, uh, is a great one. If you truly want to apply the morality of sympathy for all, you're going to stretch yourself thin because your heart, your human heart, simply doesn't have the ability to do that. So what happens next? Are you going to realize, okay, it's a stupid morality, so I get rid of it? No, most people are going to turn against themselves. They'll say, okay, I'm not good enough. I'm not enough of a saint to have sympathy for all. I need to be tougher against myself. And this is when the militant man attacks himself. This is why morality, for the most part in the West, has led to the destruction of society. It's because there, there is no need for an enemy. If morality is injected and has become corrupted, it attacks itself. So every individual and citizen of the city is going to kill himself. The enemy outside of the doors just have to wait. They, have, they just have to wait for the collapse of the city from the inside. And for the most part, there is also a chance that people from inside the city are going to open up the doors. They're going to welcome their own destruction. Again, I don't even have to be political here. This is just philosophy, but you will see that it applies to this modern world, for the most part, especially the Western world. Because when the values of morality stop being challenged, they become corrupted and they start to devour their hosts, who in turn begin to cannibalize himself to fill flesh. What it means is that, as I said, to fill something, anything, people are willing to do whatever to themselves. Because it's always better to fill, to fill pain than to fill nothing at all. And this leads us directly to nihilism. Because this is how you get nihilism, actually. The reason why I structured this video like this is because, as I explained, one leads to the other. Principles lead to judgment, that leads to morality, that leads to nihilism, if things go out of control. And this leads to this. The danger in happiness. Everything now turns out best for me. I now love every fate. Who would like to be my fate? This is the continuation. This is what nihilism does to a man or a woman. The dangers of comfort and a lack of challenge is that it paradoxically makes life really difficult. It's a key of self-improvement that you've heard times and times again, something that most good philosophers share. It's the idea that pain is a necessary part of life. 
not because of some masochistic understanding of the human existence, but because pain is something that you feel when you exert yourself. And the exertion by itself is a necessary component of a good and fulfilling existence. If you get rid of that and you end up completely surrounded with comfort and no challenge whatsoever, paradoxically, your life becomes really difficult because you're not really living your life anymore. You're not doing what you were supposed to do anymore. And by the way, this is the depression. You will find that uh, most mental illnesses are expressions of nihilism. It's why, by the way, Nietzsche believed that philosophy and psychology needed to work hand in hand. The issue is that psychology completely pushed away philosophy and they turned instead towards the uh, pharmaceutical industry to solve their problems because it was easier that way. The problem is that it solves absolutely nothing for the most part because a depression can be an expression of what I just described and not just a chemical imbalance. Can you solve the depression by just bombarding the person with pills? Yes, absolutely. Are you solving the problem? No, not at all, because the problem and the root of the problem was within the psyche of the person. Since this life made really difficult is turned that way because life expresses itself through will to power. But will to power requires resistance. If you exert your power and it just goes, right? Like, comme un couteau dans du beurre, there's no resistance. Are you really exerting your power? For the most part, you are not. And therefore, you are going to end up in a situation where you are not able to fill yourself anymore. It's what I described previously with people who cannibalize themselves. Anything for a fill. Nowadays, the modern human fills nothing. We are disconnected from our own feelings because this wood is not providing us with the ability to do that because of what we did to us. Again, it's humans that shape the wood and not the other way around. Uh, we cannot blame the environment because we are directly responsible for the creation of the environment and also we are responsible for the way we interact with said environment. And an environment without resistance is one without any joy because, understand one thing, um, the pursuit of pleasure is not a bad thing per se because it's a biological trick. The reason why we feel pleasure when we eat, for example, when we copulate, when we do certain activities is because they are good for our bodies. But it becomes a problem when you start to do the activity for pleasure's sake. It's perfectly acceptable to get tricked into doing it for pleasure's sake as long as you get the benefit that your biology in, like, implemented. Right? The pleasure is the, is the bait at the end of the hook. What matters is whether you're going to bite or not. It's the trajectory you're going to take to bite the hook. Once you bite and you have your pleasure, you should get the wisdom to understand that what mattered wasn't that in the first place. Example, lifting. Lifting boosts your endorphin levels and you feel great afterwards. But for the most part, lifters understand that the good thing about lifting is not that sensation. It's what came beforehand. That is what the true benefit is. And actually, hedonism is the very silly and simplistic expression of the mind of people who have never understood that very simple reality where they constantly chase the pleasure. But you will find that the most pleasurable things in this modern world require almost no effort whatsoever. We have access to an endless stream of pleasure. So if your motto and if your credo is pleasure for pleasure's sake, you are going to live a life of complete depravity. You're going to become a degenerate because you are going to miss on the important portion. <clears throat> and without that important, important portion, which is the struggle, any joy which should have resulted from efforts, turn into apathy. Since the goal of life isn't pleasure, but it's pursuit, which I just explained, the boon being only accessory to the hunt, the man that gets fed the fruit soon finds it tasteless, and worse, loses his will to pursue it. It's that double whammy. Not only is the level of pleasure you're receiving right now going to run stall very quickly, which is going to encourage you to find more and more sources of pleasure, but on top of that, you're not going to be interested in pursuing that pleasure in the first place with anything that costs any remote levels of effort because there exists an easier way that gives you even more pleasure. I think that this is the biggest challenge that uh, our modern society has to deal with. And the fact that we have an endless access to pleasure. Right now, if I wanted, I could go get 15 burgers, I could stuff my face, I could go home, I could jerk off, I could go down to like the shady neighborhood and get heroin and inject it in my veins, and I would feel tremendous pleasure, more than I've ever felt in my life. 
would that make me a better person? No, it would destroy me from within. But it's because I understand that the struggle and pain is the real importance in the life of a human. And not the pleasure at the end. The pleasure is nothing. Happiness. I would go as far as say that happiness is nothing. As long as happiness is that. Pursuit of happiness, bullshit. Pursuit of struggle. Happiness will come with the struggle. It's a byproduct of it. If you pursue happiness, you're going to end up a broken man. Because apathy is going to take hold of you. And the fruit is still, as, I, I, as soon as I, going, as I said, going to lose its taste. And very soon also, you will lose the will to pursue it in the first place. That is the destiny of the man who is happy. He is so happy that he loves every fate. And therefore, he stops discriminating between fates. He allows for destiny to rule his existence. And he gives in to nihilism. That is nihilism. Nihilism is being on the boat. And just giving, like, throwing away the paddles and saying, whatever. The boat will carry me wherever it carries me. And actually, it's already predestined. So I don't even have to put in effort. Putting in effort is useless. I will just take the sun, do drugs on the boat, and that's it. That is the great giving up. But it's a great giving up that inhabits the heart of most. Nihilism is a very misunderstood concept. I don't know if you've noticed. You have people nowadays who call Nietzsche a nihilist. He never was. He was an anti-nihilist philosopher. And on top of that, it almost has a form of edgy philosophy to it. Many men like to call themselves nihilistic, but they don't understand what it is in the first place. If you say you're nihilistic, it means you've given up. That's pretty much what it means. It doesn't mean that you're red-pilled. It doesn't mean that you're cynical. Being cynical is not a synonym with being red-pilled, and it's not a synonym with being a nihilist. It's very important to keep that in mind. Because worst case scenario, you're just going to some. Best case scenario, you're just going to sound stupid. And worst case scenario, you're going to espouse a philosophy you don't understand. Because, let me repeat myself, any type of ideology unexplained is only half effective. And those who swallow without knowledge only poison themselves. So you, may, you might very well have poisoned yourself with an ideology that you don't actually understand. I just described this ideology. I just described the man that is subjected to this ideology. Does it sound like something that you want to do? I think the answer is no. The reason why most men nowadays are like this is because of the welfare state. By welfare state, I do refer to a political system, but in global terms, it's more the description of a world where everything is easy to access, there is no risk of dying, you don't have to struggle anymore, and you're being spoon-fed. This is the modern world. Nowadays, you can't even really die, meaning that the state is always going to find a way to make you survive, not live survive just enough for you to be able to vote again and to be a good slave for another year. The issue is that this environment with a ton of comfort and no actual danger and nothing to strive for creates and sustains subhumans. And by subhumans, I mean people who, who like the ability to define their own values, who like the ability to find a sense in their life and to push forward. That to me is a subhuman. If you fit that category, I refuse to consider you a fellow human because you are not participating anymore. You're not evolving the species anymore. You're not part of the group anymore. You're just to the side. You gave up. And uh, one of my favorite quotes of all time is, those who give up are just boring. And I just don't like boring people. So I don't pay attention to them. And now we're going to finish this video and conclude on this chapter of nihilism and on the Nietzsche and red pills in general with the quotation that connects with what I said previously. So if you paid attention, it's going to make sense. Insanity in individuals is rare, but in groups, parties, and nations, it is the rule. I say that this connects with something because I told you previously that hatred on an individual level very scarcely leads to violent acts. But hatred on a global level, if it becomes an ideology shared by the group, can lead to genocides. Why? Because one individual times 10 is a group, and it's a hundred times worse. Uh, a rule I apply, and it also comes from my favorite author, who once said, Ils ne sont pas fous, ils sont foules, et c'est pire. That's from Pierre Bottero. Pierre Bottero, who is a genius, rest in peace, who was describing a situation where two characters were almost trampled to death by a group of, of people. And the woman says, what happened to them? They're crazy. And he says, no, they're not crazy, they're a group. When people are in a group, they don't, be, they don't behave the same way. It's actually, by the way, the reason why there is a branch of psychology that concerns itself entirely with the, uh, the, the behavioral uh, 
ability of groups to manipulate the uh, behavior of the, indi of the individual. So uh, group psychology, I think it is called, and it's absolutely fascinating. If you like, I would make a video about it, but the way the individual interacts with his environment and with others is directly influenced by whether or not he's part of a group, whether or not he's part of an ideological group, etc., etc. It's why political parties are so dangerous and so powerful. It's why religions are so powerful as well. Is because they provide someone with an identity, with a feeling of belonging. And these are very important traits for humans. It's what we, we crave the most in this world. And once the group gives you that, it takes something in return. And that something is your free will and your ability to decide for yourself. So for the most part, taken individually, people are decent. But the second you put them in groups, they become crazy. And that is because any type of group think leads to the destru destruction of the individual and therefore also the destruction of common sense. This reflects horribly, of course, on society because it's exactly what happened to us. We have globalized thoughts, we have globalized feelings with the sympathy for all I described previously, which renders it completely useless and, and if anything, actually turns it into a poison. When it comes to that type of belief, the vector tends to be morality, tends to be religion, it tends to be politics. So it's a belief in something, the belief in something that is going to make you join a group, at which point the group is going to convince you that questioning the group is a sin, you're going to stop to question it, you're going to lose your identity, and you just become a slave to the group. But keep in mind that a lack of belief or faith altogether, so its absence, is just as dangerous, because nihilism is the belief in nothing. You believe that nothing matters. And therefore, it's still a belief. That's what cracks me up with the black pill. And talking about black pills, that's what I'm going to concern myself with the next episode. But you're going to see that I'm actually going to speak about real black pills, meaning things that are not comfortable to face, that pertain to you, your behavior, the things you do, the things that make you a horrible person, but that if revealed are going to make it easier for you to improve yourself. Today, we mostly spoke about red pills and breaking the conditioning, so the wood around you, but at some point, we're going to have to take a deep dive in the individual, and that individual is you. I will see you in two weeks. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.